You're listening to Science and Saucery, a show dedicated to adding life to your years. And now your hosts, registered dietitian Juliana Hever and scientist Ray Cronice. Welcome. Hello, Raymond. Another day. Yes. How have you been? I'm so good. How have you been? It's been great. We're into 2020. Isn't that weird? It's like so, it's a new decade. It's absolutely crazy. Wild. Time flies. So we've had lots of different requests for interviews and we've had some great interviews already and some other ones coming up. But today's interview was one I was really excited about. We were lucky enough to be able to do this last minute. Yes. So how many of you out there have seen the Game Changers movie yet? It's streaming on Netflix. I think they had a theatrical release, but it's been streaming on Netflix for quite a while, a couple months now, I want to say, yes. maybe a month or two. Really great, inspiring movie. I don't know what you guys thought. There was a lot of controversy because, you know, a lot of athletes don't want to give up their meat. And it was kind of a compelling film that, that documents why perhaps not only is it okay, but might be beneficial. Right. So we've got James Wilkes, one of the producers. This was his baby. And we're excited to introduce him and, and to talk to him about his film. James, how are you doing? Great, thanks. And uh, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. We absolutely loved the film and we want to hear about it. But what I love about the film is mostly was your story. And would you mind sharing a little bit about your story? You've got this great background and as an ultimate fighter and a combat trainer. But tell us a little bit about your journey to get to where you are now. Yeah, so I was uh, training for a fight in the UFC because I'd previously won the ultimate fighter, which got me a contract there. And uh, basically, I got injured sparring with a future heavyweight champion. I tore ligaments in both of my knees. And I thought, well, what can I do productive, you know, with my time? Uh, and I thought I knew quite a lot about nutrition, but I thought, well, I'll, I'll dig into it and really see what I could do to fuel my body to both recover optimally and then perform optimally after that. Uh, and that's when I came across a study about the Roman gladiators. Uh, and it was showed that basically they were eating a predominantly plant-based diet. And I thought, well, that can't be true because you have to have meat and animal products to be strong and healthy. And the evidence also showed that they had, um, you know, strong bones and strong muscles. And I thought, well, how could they be doing that eating uh, mostly plants or exclusively plants? Um, that's when I started really digging into the literature. I was sort of shocked that a lot of what I've been led to believe that you needed meat and animal products, you know, basically I thought at every meal to be strong and athletic, I uh, just simply wasn't true. So it really sort of drove me to really dig deeper and deeper, talking to the experts and the athletes uh, that were eating this way and, um, and see what it was all about. And did you start by implementing it into your routine? Um, not, not right away. Um, after a couple of months of, uh, sort of digging into it, I thought, well, I'll give it a try. And so I didn't commit to doing it permanently. I just thought, well, let's see how it impacts me and see how I feel. So I gradually over time started incorporating more plant-based options and, uh, cutting out, I think first I cut out red meat and then chicken, you know, fish, and then, um, I think dairy and then fish and then eggs were the last thing to go. And, uh, yeah, and it's once I switched, I just, uh, definitely noticed the difference in my both in my endurance, uh, which I touch on in the film, um, but also my strength as well, which, you know, you can't pack everything into one 90-minute film, so I didn't really talk about that in the film. <laughs> yeah. Both of those uh, improved significantly. Yeah, and, you know, I came from the same perspective that I was doing it for exclusively a health reason. It was diabetes, and I had really gone down to the last three things I had was uh, fish, eggs, and a little bit of yogurt and cottage cheese, sort of the Bill Phillips body for life approach. And Dean Ornish, I met him at TedMed, and he had suggested that I drop those three things to do with my poor glucose performance. And, you know, nothing in my education and background prepared me for the idea that eating more starchy vegetables and fruits was going to reverse my poor glucose control. Like, no one talks about it that way. And when you see such a change, which will you probably observe too, when it's so in your face and it goes against everything you believe to be true, it's a really different kind of experience, I think, than someone who 
you know, has maybe an ideological bent that gets them in or they, you know, they have some sort of motivating factor. Did, did you find that to be the case with you? Yeah, no, I definitely think so. I think because I, it was so ingrained um, that I really was shocked when I, when I noticed the difference. Um, so just really incredible. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't just my experience. There was you know, all the athletes we interviewed. There was very similar experiences in terms of uh, you know, primarily around sort of inflammation and recovery, um, improvements in endurance. It was, it was very similar. So yeah, I was really shocked to, um, you know, to experience that. What, what inspired you to actually go out and make a whole amazing movie about it? Because that's quite a journey that you've had on that as well. Yeah, I actually woke up at like two in the morning, um, you know, after I've been digging into this for a little while and thought, well, you know, how can I have been lied to all this time? I really hate being lied to. So I thought, well, I've got to tell everyone about this. And, you know, something, what's the best way? Okay, I've got to make a documentary. So I woke up at two in the morning. I just couldn't go back to sleep, you know, got on um, got on computer, started looking at, you know, cameras and lighting and looking at what athletes I could interview uh, and just sort of went from there. And to start with, you know, I didn't know if this would be a big project, but I thought, well, I'll either put it for free on the internet or use this footage, um, you know, to get more interest. Because I didn't know anyone in sort of the plant-based world. And I didn't know anyone in film. I didn't really have the funds. So I didn't really know where it would go at that point. But I knew that I wanted to put something out to, you know, let people know what I'd found. So you talked about the stuff that's not in the film. What do you think the strongest case for eating a plant-based diet specifically for performance that you didn't include? Um, I think, you know, one of the things is we didn't really talk about, you know, when we talked about the protein being offset, you know, if you're, if you're having so much protein, you're offsetting some of the carbohydrates because, you know, for most, most athletes eating more carbohydrates is going to be better. And where do those come from? They come from plants. You know, there's some recent studies showing switching to a uh, sort of a, a plant-based diet can show better muscle improvement over having a higher protein diet. So people don't really pick up enough on, you know, people just think that more is better. Um, you know, and people will say, oh, well, there's gluconeogenesis and you convert, um, you know, protein into glucose and you can use that for energy, but that's quite an inefficient method. So we didn't really get to touch on that. Um, you know, I think we also didn't get to touch on actual studies it's very difficult in a film to get everything that you want to get in right so there was there was a number of studies where people on plant-based diets at baseline when they recruited people had the same peak uh peak power output same um uh, uh same average output same body mass um and that was with lower creatine stores so people on plant-based diets have uh, lower creatine stores typically unless they supplement and then there are actually studies going on to show s same at baseline but if people on plant-based diets supplemented with creatine they actually increased more muscle mass than the uh, omniv omnivores uh, and they had better output better muscle gain you know over a two-month period gaining more than uh, one pound uh, of muscle more than the group they're eating meat so we didn't really get to you know go into all of that so I think that was one thing is, you know, we know that creatine is ergogenic and, and you know, performance enhancing. Uh, and we didn't get to show that despite the deficit of creatine, um, you know, people are getting equivocal gains. And then if they incorporate creatine into their nutrition uh, on a plant-based diet, they're actually getting better gains, better performance output than those um, on omnivorous diets. Yeah. And this is a really important point because when I met Juliana, one of the things from a perspective of uh, dietetics and in, in general, you know, is she was always having to defend a plant-based diet to be good enough. And one of the things I pressed upon her when we bring in the health span side of this, you know, the longevity health span literature, which yep. is separate from medicine, it's separate from athletics. So people are just starting to really hear this with our collaborator, David Sinclair, with his book that came out, Lifespan. You're starting to hear about this more. But the idea that less is more in healthspan, we've never really, by feeding it tons of extra nutrition, you know, dietary restriction without malnutrition has been the key. And so there are diets, when you're talking about it, that we might use to optimize for performance because you are an athlete, because you do want to win. But that doesn't automatically mean that is automatically the best for healthspan. And what the kind of results you were just talking about sort of lend to is this idea that recovery, if we think of it, the anabolic as the go, go, grow, 
and then the recovery as being part of that repair and for the organism to survive the famine or survive longer. And it's not surprising to me that athletes get a good response on a plant-based diet because they do have more time to recover because they aren't chronically overnourished. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And I think, you know, that sort of um, overconsumption of a certain nutrient, you know, for example, protein is a great, uh, a great one to look at because we know if you have too much protein, you know, you're offsetting uh, the carbohydrates there for, for most sports, that's going to be better. Um, and then same with health, right? If you're having, especially the animal protein, you're getting, um, you know, high levels of methionine or leucine. So you're increasing the mTOR pathway, yep. um, the IGF-1. And so you're increasing cancer risk growth. And so I think there is, um, you know, there is a difference, you know, potentially between the optimal diet for longevity and health and health span and then the optimal diet for performance. But both can be done, you know, on, on plant-based diets. You know, do we want to supplement with creatine, for example, for athletic performance and muscle gain? Potentially, is that optimal for health? Potentially not. Right. But you're basically offsetting, you know, there are a number of pathways to cancer, right? So even if... So, people that are trying to build as much muscle as possible, you know, playing football or fighting in the UFC or bodybuilding, those aren't optimal for longevity or right. health. So exactly. we, have to under, we have to understand that we're foregoing something. So by getting it's your trade-off. nutrients on a plant-based diet, yeah, exactly. Uh, getting it on a plant-based diet, you're still going to reduce the um, you know, number of the cancer pathways, even if you decide, okay, I want to have lots of leucine because that might optimal, optimize muscle growth. But certainly you can get that on the plant-based diet. But if you start having more and more leucine now, you know, there's definitely uh, seems to be a connection there between the or and the IGF-1, and that's going to become problematic. And where are you going to get more of that, you know, on an on a animal-based diet? Exactly. And we talk about this with like a soft landing in terms of, you know, going through life and, and starting in that world of trying to optimize performance. And that's your number one goal. And then later on, like we always say, at 40, 50 years old, when Mother Nature is done with you, you need to start thinking kind of differently and kind of changing your approach. And that's what we're that's what it's it's a hard intersection. It's it's really it's tough for a lot, of, especially for athletes, to have to kind of shift thinking and shift their the goal and the methodology that you've been so ingrained on how to do things. And it's really it's really interesting to watch people. I, the response to the film has been really intriguing, at least from an audience perspective. I'm curious how you feel about about the response. Is it what you expected? Is it? Can you tell us a bit about how you feel about it? Yeah, I mean, it's been overwhelmingly positive, uh, especially in the sort of demographic that we thought would be most resistant. So sort of young men, uh, sort of traditional men, you know, perhaps playing sports. Um, we thought they would be sort of the most resistant, but they've actually been overwhelmingly positive from sort of bodybuilders, firefighters, law enforcement. Uh, in fact, the military has been probably had the most interest out of any sort of sector which has been really interesting because they you know the military is interested in what the science is they're not interested in like the fairy tales of trying to eat and emulate what our ancestors were eating or you know anything <laughs> sort of fad diets they're interested in what's actually you know what is the um you know what is the current research showing and you know the film has been reviewed by um the defense health agency of the department of defense and by the Special Operations Medical Association, and they've looked at all of the, you know, the references and looked into the claims. And the, you know, the film has been accredited by the Defense Health Agency and endorsed by the Special Operations Medical Association. So it just goes to speak to the credibility of the film, and to see, you know, that sort of sector showing extreme interest. Um, they're interested in warfighter effectiveness, so essentially the performance of the soldiers, and they're also in, interested in bringing down their exorbitant healthcare costs and retraining costs of the soldiers because if you can't pass a physical then they have to retrain that uh, soldier for that position all over again um so it's really interesting to see a a sector like that taking significant interest in the film that's fantastic it was really interesting to watch on joe rogan's interview of seeing the guy who typically would have been the meathead is the plant-based guy and the typical guy that you know people would may pejoratively <laughs> call the beta male was the lean thin guy <laughs> was the actual advocate for animal products and it, and just seeing that juxtaposed and that really sort of the 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 clash and the dichotomy there you know i, I don't know it, it seems it to me the idea that you can take this in that direction because we all know i mean 
Juliana, you, myself, anybody who's been in this for a period of time, whether it's Rich Roll or Matt Frazier at No Me Athlete, all, all of us realize that this is not an impediment to athletic performance. But it's amazing what the resistance is and seeing people like that that really care about the endpoints and they can't deal with the obesity, they can't deal with the di- the diabetes. They don't want to see the biomarkers going in the wrong direction when they're or in- they excuse away the bad biomarker direction, <laughs> right? You know, and try to explain. The so it just seems to have a person like you that comes from that background. It is just so disruptive in the message. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we know, you know, obviously, none of that was really intentional. It was just my personal journey. And I was generally interested in protein and really believed in the myth myself that we need meat for protein, but also to be a real man, like I truly believe those things. Right. But it sort of just so happens that, you know, the the framing of um, something is often more important than you know, the actual facts itself. And unfortunately, we have both on our side, we have, you know, these amazing athletes as, as role models, but we also have the science to back it all up. So I think it's a, a good combination to have, you know, these various role models um, in the, in these athletes in the film, and then also the the science as well. Right. Absolutely, I, I love the way you handled it. it. Was very positive. I mean, honestly, as the girl in the room, like the whole penis section, <laughs> that was really important huh. because, you know, everyone's making a lot of jokes and talking about it, but because it's so provocative and so true, and nobody wants to talk about this elephant in the room, and we've got all of these issues, and we've got one cardiovascular system, and that was such a great way to demonstrate it. I just, I've never seen it done like that. You know, we've talked about it with cardiologists and. But from that perspective where you brought in the young, the young athletes and like just made it, you know, it was, it was a really beautiful, fun way that I think would wake up that, that uh, demographic that you were talking about at the beginning. It probably got their attention because no one talks about that stuff, but it's important. Yeah. I mean, we, we were, we were worried about putting that, you know, filming that scene and James Cameron, you know, cause we'd get on the phone with him for an hour or two at a time, um, you know, occasionally talking about the storyline and what we wanted to put in. And there was a number of options. Uh, we almost filmed something with, uh, looking through the back of the eye. Uh, so you can look at the blood flow in the back of the eye. Right. And so you could eat an animal based meal and you could literally see the arteries, you know, uh, constricting. And we thought that would be an interesting visual. Um, but then, you know, with, uh, with this sort of real man eat meat myth, we know that eight out of 10 uh, plant-based eaters currently are female, you know, 18 to 45 year old males each twi- twice as much meat as women. They seem to be quite resistant and that real man eat meat myth is really underlying. So we thought that addressing, you know, arterial function to the penis would be uh, pretty important. And again, some people have said, oh, well, that wasn't a scientifically validated study, but we actually said that in the film. Right, you know, right. Um, Dr. Spitz, you know, said that. And as filmmakers, we could have cut that piece out. You know, we could have not included it. But we felt it was important for the honesty and integrity and to say, look, this is the, the things in the film, like the, the blood test, uh, so the, the, the blood vials with the Miami Dolphins, you know, after eating a meal and the yes. postprandial lipemia with the lactescence and then the erectile scene. Um, you know, these are simply illustrations to get across the point of things that we already know about in the scientific literature. So, you know, for more than 20 years, we've we've known that, um, you know, a heavy animal based meal will impair arterial flow and endothelial function. And so, you know, those studies have been done. We couldn't put them all in the film. Of course. Um, but the erectile function experiment and, you know, the, the one with the Miami Dolphins with the blood vials, yeah. they're simply meant to be illustrations for a documentary to sort of show people visually uh, or not so visually, hopefully, with the uh, rectal function. But, <laughs> right, no, I mean, it's um, visceral you know, and it, it's dem- emotional. Yeah, it's a great demonstration. It's it's People can resonate with it. And there is absolutely the science to back that up. And we've known about the science, but people don't talk about it. And that's what was so great about this, because usually this is something that occurs down the line, you know, in an older age. And this is when people are going to deal early death. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like they say, uh-huh. the canary in the coal mine. I mean, right. we've got one cardiovascular system. Everything's connected. Arterial function is directly related to our diet in major, major ways. And, you know, what's great also is that you guys have this wonderful website and everything's, you know, got all this literature, you know, organized so that anyone has any questions and wants to dig deeper, they can and we encourage them to do so because there's so much information out there and it's, you know, it's good to have the actual primary literature. And and there's two things both of you are saying that I think is, you know, really needs to be impacted a little bit. And the first thing is exactly what you're saying, James, what the, the, this defense of, you know, we're just doing something um, that's an illustration. And today there is this surge now, especially on like Twitter or, or social media, 
you put something up like this and then immediately these people come out and say, well, you know, there weren't enough people and there weren't, you know, ca- you know, correlation, you know, doesn't mean causation, causation, you know, all of these <laughs> crazy yeah. things. And it's like you can't even have the beginning of the conversation. It's like, well, does correlation mean nothing? No, of course not. It's the start of it. And the other side right. of this is the research side, because, you know, I did protein synthesis in in the 90s. OK, so we were going in and modifying DNA and producing proteins and looking at protein fold. So I was at that level, but I didn't understand what protein was at a dietary level. And I know a lot of physicians, a right. lot of researchers, even ones that are doing diet studies where they're gaming. If you've seen our food triangle, they're gaming, you know, sugar versus oil. OK, so. Basically, it's our best plate against your worst plate. And you can't say everybody has some kind of bias when it comes to this, including these researchers. Some of it might be what we've talked about, which they're, they're actually um, the sponsors. But, but even beyond that, the idea that you know all of these things, when we just talk about protein, carbs, and fat, these aren't isometabolic. And that's what you're talking about when you're talking about the specific amino acids. And it's not just animal versus plant. It just means animals and plants concentrate nutrition in fundamentally different ways. But when we actually right. compare a real plant-based diet to a real, a, a healthy, as healthy as you can make animal, you know, normal mixed diet, what you find is you're going to have a difference in protein, carbs, and fat. So then when you prepare the study, if you control for that, you're not going right. to see as many differences. Does that make sense? So that this detail that yeah, you're over controlling. You're over controlling yeah. exactly. So I I think yes. you know, I think people are really push on when you're trying to make a, a a position like this and saying, well, this isn't scientifically valid. This is just a defense mechanism. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. I was in uh, some sort of debate briefly online yesterday talking about the exact same thing. People saying, well, you didn't, you know, that study didn't control for you know, calories that didn't match the macronutrients. Like that's one of the things like then clearly you don't understand the nutrition science. If you think that everything, what do you want to match next? You want to ma- match uh, amino acid profile and, uh, you know, trans fat intake. Yeah. Uh, that's another thing about the health aspect, which I wish we'd got into is that people don't realize that there's trans fats in, in meat and dairy naturally occurring. And there are some studies showing that it doesn't really matter if those trans fats are from partially hydrogenated vegetable oil or from animal products. There's so many things that we would have liked to have fit in the film that we just couldn't squeeze in right. in 90 minutes. Well, right. you, got, you got a lot in. But yeah, the whole trans fat is like, it's basically an artificial saturated fat. And exactly. no one wants to admit that saturated fat is still a problem. Like it's been exonerated for no reason from these nonsense meta-analyses that yeah. people wanted to hear that information. So they've run with it and they're, they're abusing it. Saturated fat that hasn't changed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, cis, cis fats naturally have that kink. Plants do those polyunsaturation. The unsaturation can have a result in a cis or trans linkage, and that means you can either have a linear chain that acts a lot like animal fats where we want to pack as much as we can in a little space because we move around. You know, plants don't run very fast, and they don't have a cardiovascular system. So staying liquid at a, at a colder temperature is good for those polyunsaturated fats, and most of the negative stuff we see online about plant fats really come down to oils and really come down to spreads. And that's where we've hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated these. And they're no longer plant fats or oil. Right. A lot of them have these other bonds that act a lot like the saturated fats. It's, it's, right. It really surprises me that I thought this way. That, that's the part, and I think you can relate to this too. I know Juliana can, but you know she was right in that point of going into her d- degree at about the time. Well, no, I fi- I had finished grad school when I finally looked at it with more of an objective ability, a perspective. And like you, James, I was mad. I'm like, I feel like even in graduate school, like in my textbooks, it felt like being lied to. It was so inaccurate and it was so off point that it was really upsetting. And that, I felt the same way as you. I, I wanted to just tell everyone about it too, and that's that's what inspired me as well. So I. I understand. Well, I've, I've also, you know, one of the things that I often question is as people get higher and higher levels of education, they come, tend to become more narrow focused on what their field of expertise is, right? So it feels like, you know, if you're doing a PhD and you're studying a certain amino acid um, and, and it's of impacts and then, you know, you're studying that on rats, like you fail to like pull out and look at the big picture, you know, from like the 40,000 viewpoint, uh, 40,000 feet. Um, so do you think that's also a factor is, is the, the higher level of education, the more specific and the more reductionist people become? 
Yeah, you know the joke about that, right? No, I don't. A specialist is someone who knows more and more about less and less until they know <laughs> everything about nothing. Right, that's true. That's so true. And a generalist is someone who knows less and less about more and more until they know nothing about everything. Right, that's funny. And and don't forget, on top of that, is if you're in academia, you also have to bring in funding. The university gets half of that funding. And then on top of that, you've got to find something that has some upside because you know, there's only so much government funding, so you can get funding on things that have an economic or upside. So this is the same problem with longevity health span research. Part of the problem is, is that aging isn't a disease. So we can't hit right. aging, uh, the underlying aging mechanisms, because they want to target a specific drug, because you can't go to the FDA and say, I want to cure aging. You're not you're not able right. to do that, and or I want to slow aging. You're not able to do that from a you know it's not a disease, and in some sense, what we're all talking about in this is that our whole food plant based diet versus our previous more omnivorous diet, it segregates all of these macronutrients in a different way. It's not easy to study outside of that, and it's also difficult to do this on a wide population you know, in a control fashion over the years it takes to do it. It's just like cigarettes. If we actually had to absolutely do a smoking versus non-smoking over a lifetime, it would be hard to do that. It would be unethical to to do it in some sense. Right. And and today it's unethical not to give someone statins if they're not going to change their diet. And And these biases permeate all researchers and all people because everybody eats. It's worse than... Than smoking. It's worse than these other things because these are at least behaviors someone can recognize as optional. But being part of what's socially normal versus what's biologically normal is a completely different thing. So I think we're all moving the needle now. And I think what you've done is going to move the needle as well because even separating athletics from health, that you recognize that. I know that wasn't the purpose of the documentary, but that you recognize that and you see it so clearly to me, really gives hope because for a long time, I don't think the plant-based community saw this. Right, totally. Well, and, ba and back to the last point too, is that when I was in grad school, one of the things I noticed, like my first red flag or one of my biggest red flags was reading, you know, every book said, you know, three servings of dairy a day. Everyone needs, like it was like, you know, all over the place. And then when you really look closely, there was always at the bottom, sponsored by the Dairy Council in the fine print at the bottom of the page. It's like, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, the dairy industry is telling me I need to tell my clients that they need, or patients, that they need to have this. But, um, and that is so, it's like at the beginning, like we get those messages starting in preschool. You know, those messages are everywhere, infused into our life everywhere, from the cafeteria walls to the education that we get, at, you know, all the way through till graduate school, medical school. I've sat in on nutrition classes in medical school and it's just there, there's so much confusion and misinformation and not enough emphasis on how powerful diet is that there's just so many reasons that people are so confused and people and the, and physicians don't feel comfortable recommending making dietary recommendations because not only is there bias inherent in their world, but they're also not trained and they're also believing, like you said, also, they don't think that patients will implement those changes. And that's why it's easier to just prescribe the statin. Yeah, totally. And I, I do think things are changing. You know, I like can, can, Canada's Food Guide has now removed dairy as a food group. You know, the World Health Organization, the FAO, A&D, they're all starting to recognize that you can be completely healthful and, and may be able to prevent or reverse some of the chronic, major chronic diseases, you know, through a plant-based diet. So I think, you know, I do think uh, things are changing and I'm quite hopeful about things. Yes. And I'm so grateful for your film because we had, you know, we... Every time a movie comes out that's really inspiring, I get a rush of people saying, how do I do this? People get inspired. And I, this did absolutely happen when your movie came out. And people were rushing, saying, I saw this movie. I saw Game Changers. What do I do? I want to do this. You know, so that's you've lit the, yeah. the fire. And I think that's really an amazing contribution. So we're always talking about this from a research perspective. If you had the, the big research budget, um, what would you, having seen what you've seen, what what would be your research project you'd like to fund? Um, I mean, I'd really like to see, you know, I don't think there's enough, I think there should be more studies, right? So I think, you know, a lot of uh, the things that we're doing is inferring from studies that currently exist. We're looking at, um, 
you know, what certain plant foods do, what certain animal foods do, um, and trying to understand biological mechanisms, looking at epidemiological data, and we're sort of looking at all these things pointing and seeing which direction they point in. And I think it's very clear for both health and athletic performance that a plant-based diet is going to be optimal. But it would be nice to have something a little bit more concrete. So, you know, a randomized trial, um, put people on for, say, six months, um, and compare that to someone eating a whole foods diet that included, um, you know, a fair bit of animal products for comparison. And look at, you know, um, especially for athletic performance, I would like to see, you know, one rep max, uh, muscle thickness gains, uh, endurance, uh, body composition, maybe using a DEXA scan, and then also looking at, you know, uh, blood markers as well. I think it would be really interesting to to really randomize it and, and have a looking at the, you know, two types of diets, at least two, maybe compared to a standard American diet as well, which I don't think anyone really believes is healthy. But, you know, I think I would like to see more randomized trials uh, looking at that. And I think, uh, that would really put the nail in the coffin. James, do you still have time to do combat training? Or are you so busy with the film? Uh, I'm doing it uh, occasionally. You know, I just got a request down from uh, San Diego, from the Marines down there. Um, still doing some law enforcement uh, training occasionally. Um, but no, I mean, a lot. there's a lot of requests for like speaking and, and screenings and things like that for the film. And then, as you pointed out, our website has resources and we're continuing to build those out. So recipes, shopping, to, shopping tips, eating out tips. Uh, we're putting together a sort of Facebook um, community group where people can talk to the experts and the athletes. And so very busy with, you know, game changers related things, basically. So what are some of the, the your most intriguing questions that you're getting when you're doing Q&As after the screenings? Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, one, one of the biggest things is people are always sort of asking why we didn't cover certain things in the film, <laughs> you know, so people say, well, you covered everything <clears throat> except for you didn't cover pregnancy. <laughs> um, why didn't, why didn't you cover pregnancy or you covered everything except you didn't cover children. You should have covered children or well, you should have covered, you know, the starving, the people, you know, who are starving to death every day because we take grains from their country to feed our cattle or. I think it's it's sort of asking the questions uh, that are harder to answer. It's like, why didn't you include this? I mean, the reality is that you've got 90 minutes or less, really, because people tend not to want to watch documentaries that are over an hour and a half. And it really is, it was difficult to fit in what we wanted to fit in uh, on the subject matter that we wanted to fit in, let alone, you know, going into other areas. Um, so that, that, I think, are the most challenging questions. It's like, hey, why didn't you cover this in the film? Uh, it's just so difficult to cover everything you want to cover. I mean, we interviewed a lot more people than we put in the film, not just athletes and experts on nutrition, but we also, you know, for example, started looking at brain function and we interviewed um, Dr. Brian Green, the one of the world's leading theoretical physicists, um, or we interviewed uh, Daniel Negrano, one of the most winning or the most winning poker player, um, and sort of started looking at brain function and alertness and things like that. And we would have liked to have covered all of that as well. But those are the questions that are, that are sort of... Um, so is there a sequel? Question. I was just going to say, sequel? is that the next movie? <laughs> you... uh, well, the funny thing is we've got 600 hours of footage, you know, to create an 80, what was 86 minutes in the end. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot, it's about 50 or more people that we interviewed that we didn't get to put in. And we... I don't, there won't be a sequel as in a full length documentary, but we do want to start putting those interviews, extended interviews, and then also some of the interviews that never even got seen. Uh, we'll put some of those on our website or on social media uh, and keep putting out um, more information. So, Fantastic. Yeah, I love to keep it going. That's, that's yes. great. So. so where do you want people or can we send people to go find out more besides watching Game Changers if they haven't seen it already? Yeah, so the, the website has a bunch of resources on. That's GameChangersMovie.com. And then uh, Facebook and Instagram are at GameChangersMovie. Twitter is at GCMovie. Um, and so people can go and follow those um, those links and uh, we'll try to put you know information out uh, on there about what's happening in the film. Like we just came out with the DVD and Blu-ray, for example, which includes the, uh, the 22 minutes of bonus content that originally aired in theaters when we did the uh, one night theatrical around the world. Um, but, uh, and then surprisingly, a lot of people are requesting DVDs and Blu-rays because they want to give it as a gift mm. uh, to people and then they want that bonus footage. So that's great. Um, but yeah, following those social media handles and, and the website. 
Fantastic. Well, congratulations, James. Yes, congratulations. You did a great job. Oh, thanks so much. And thanks for all the work you guys do. And thanks for having me on. Well, that was a lot of fun. And it's great to see that he has really done the background outside of athletics. Yeah, very well-rounded, very, very informative. Thank you all for joining us on this leafy green path to good health. It's always the food, so remember, keep, keep eating, eating right. right. Thank you for listening to Science and Saucery. For more details about the content in today's show or to contact Juliana and Ray, please visit us at healthspansolution.com. Welcome.